We saw the chimney spouting the f smoke and fire and the smell, and it looked like hell. We didn't know what was happening there. Just the, f just the picture of those chimneys and the fire, I can't describe it. It is unbelievable and undescribable, and we all got frightened and didn't know what off. Our heads were shaved, and oh, they took all our clothes, and we were naked there. And we slowly were sent into a barrack where there were showers. But we didn't know anything about any other showers. So it didn't worry us, and it, they were real showers, and we washed in the cold water and no towel and nothing, and we ran around there like naked. And the man looking at us, no, it was awful, that beginning. We were frightened, but we still didn't know of what. And then we were sent to some other barracks where there were already other people. It was cold and windy and horrible. And a friend of mine who was standing next to me asked one of the girls who were there, when will I see my parents? And they all started laughing like mad, you stupid cow or God knows what not. They are in the chimney by now. And by in that moment, you knew what was happening there. Not uh, how and what, but you knew they were burning the people in the chimneys. My mother was in Auschwitz for 10 days, which was, you know, although a short space of time, she said it really was hell on earth. She said it was like Dante's Inferno. People there, everybody stopped looking human somehow. Anka's parents, her sisters, her brother-in-law and her nephew had all been sent to Auschwitz a long time before Anka and her husband. And when they arrived there, they were able to keep their luggage, they kept their clothes, they went shaved, they went tattooed. And they were sent to what was called a familia lager. One or two of the wooden huts in Auschwitz-Birkenau had families together. And there was just one very cynical reason why, and that was so that they could be forced to write postcards home. And my aunt, my mother's older sister, Dena, she wrote a postcard to her cousin who still happened to be in Prague. Shall I translate? My dear ones, I am here with my husband and sister and her son, and we are all uh, fine, I hope that you are all well and uh, happy. Best wishes to us, yours, then, and so on. The postcards had to be written in German so the Germans could censor them. And my aunt was desperate to get a message out in code. And the, the code word is in the address, in the first line of the address, where the lady to whom it was sent, her first name was Olga, well, the word Olga doesn't feature in the postcard, and where the word Olga should be is the word Lechem. The word Lechem is not German, it's Hebrew, and it means bread. And my aunt was telling her cousin that they were starving. Olga did receive the postcard, understood the message, and sent a parcel. But by the time the card had been posted, Anka's parents, sisters, brother-in-law and nephew had all been killed. Anka had arrived at Auschwitz pregnant with Eva, and her life was in grave danger. The Nazis assessed all inmates and decided who would live and who would die. 
we went through these so-called selections that they picked people who were most capable of eventually doing some war work. Pregnant women were routinely sent straight to the gas chambers. But for now, Anka's pregnancy would go undetected. She was selected to live. We were given some food and some better clothes, and we were put on a train and sent away from Auschwitz, and that was just marvelous. The feeling that we were leaving Auschwitz alive, you just can't imagine. It was heaven. In October 1944, Anka was just three months into her pregnancy. If discovered, she would be sent straight back to Auschwitz to a certain death. But for now, the greatest threat to Anka and her unborn child was the lack of food and warmth. We were like sardines again in that train, and there was only one bucket, and it all started overflowing pretty quickly, and no food and no water. Anka was on her way to an armaments factory. We went up a hill to a huge factory, and it opened the door, and it was warm there. And we saw and smelled the bed bugs. I don't know if you, have, if you have ever seen one, but they are little beetles, which wouldn't matter so much, but they have that certain smell, it's sort of sweet. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I never smelled it since, and I don't. I hope not to smell it again. But there were thousands of them, and that meant warmth. Anchor was to spend the next six months riveting the tail fin of the V1, the unmanned flying bomb the notorious doodlebug. Compared to Auschwitz, the factory was a haven, but Anka's life was still at risk. I was getting thinner and thinner, but the, my stomach was getting bigger and bigger. Discovery of her condition would have meant her immediate return to the gas chambers. I perhaps am the only person, idiotic as I am, who thought that I would get through it and I will come home. Never doubted it. And seeing all these people going in the gas every day and every day and so on and so on, and being pregnant and the baby, I knew I was coming home, which is totally stupid. But I lived with this idea. By the February of 1945, Anka was seven months pregnant and was now in great danger of being discovered by the Nazis. Miraculously, she would be spared the fate of the gas chambers. At the end of the January, Auschwitz had been liberated by the Russians. But there was now a new threat to Anka's life. The Nazis had started to evacuate the camps and factories to annihilate all living witnesses to the Holocaust. Anka was put on yet another torturous train journey, heading south, away from the advancing Allies. There was no food and no water and no nothing, and we were in with open coal wagons. The train journey lasted three weeks, and during this time, many people lost their lives to hunger. Anka was on the brink of starvation and by now was nine months pregnant. Finally, the train arrived at its destination. Mauthausen death camp. At this very moment, Anka went into labor. When my mother saw the name Mauthausen at the station, she was very shocked because as opposed to when she'd arrived in Auschwitz not knowing what that was, this time she knew because she had heard about this appalling place from very early on in the war. And she says the shock was so great that she thinks it provoked the onset of her labor. And she started to give birth to me on that coal truck. We went up the hill and I was sort of starting to give birth to the child. And there they stopped just before 
the opening of the main doors of Mauthausen. And then I had to climb down from that wagon and nobody helped me. And there was this Russian doctor who was with us and whom you knew slightly, the prisoner. And she was just passing. I begged her to help me and she turned around and went. And I mean a doctor. The baby came out and we were still going for about 10, 10 minutes, I think. And then they called a doctor from the camp, the prisoner. And he was a gynecologist by pure fluke. And he cut the baby off and smacked it bottom. And it was a healthy baby. And I was in heaven. Her arms were like my little finger. I mean, it's tiny. You didn't dare to touch her. They think I weighed about three pounds. I was wrapped in paper. My mother just held me all the time. Despite all the odds, Anka's baby had made it into the world, but at the worst possible moment. The Nazis were desperately getting rid of all witnesses to their crimes. In the dying days of the war, thousands were shot, gassed and starved to death. Anka and her newborn baby were on their way to the gas chambers of Mauthausen. But then, another miracle. The Germans disappeared. Nobody threw them out, nobody, suddenly they were gone. There are two reasons why we survived. And the first is that on the 28th of April, 1945, the uh, Nazis had dismantled the gas chamber in Mauthausen. Well, my birthday is 29th. So presumably, had my mother arrived on the 26th or 27th again, I wouldn't be sitting here today. And the second reason we survived was because a few days after uh, my birth, the American army liberated the camp. My mother reckons she wouldn't have lasted much longer. Anka's four years of Nazi imprisonment were finally over. When she was strong enough, she and baby Eva returned home to Prague. Anka was free at last, but she and Eva were now alone in the world. That was the worst moment of the whole war for me, to arrive in Prague, which I wished all through the time, when will I be home? And there was no home. I come from a big family and there was nobody, nothing. I didn't know where my next meal will come from because I had no money, no clothes and a little baby. But nevertheless, she still had a vestige of optimism in the back of her mind. And um, she asked somebody to give her some money to go on the tram. And she thought that if anybody had survived, there was a chance it would be her cousin. I ring the bell and the door opens and the whole family waits for me there and say, where have you been? We heard you are coming to us. And they were just marvelous. Uh, now I will start crying. I can't. Well, I asked them if I could stay a few days, and they said, of course. And the few days ran to three and a half years, and it was just, I found a new family. Other survivors returned home to discover they had lost everything and everything.